as David said, he, my father was deafened in the war, and the war had a huge effect on him, psychologically as well as physically. And one of the reasons that he made the big country was because it made fun of the sort of macho thing about the Old West. <laughs> I must say that knowing my father, mm -hmm. um, he thought, you know, he worked very, very hard on the, uh, as all most directors do beforehand, breaking, so that you would get on the set, you have everything's thought out. And I suspect that he probably had planned to get uh, Peck bucked off uh, <laughs> without, without telling Peck, mm -hmm. who was also the co-producer, his partner on the movie. Now, they had been really close friends uh, yeah. before. Something happened, obviously, during the shooting. It might, of, have, uh, might have been the bucking off. <laughs> <laughs> but they, uh, they stopped talking. They did. They did speak for years. Uh, because they had this uh, disagreement uh, about what in the family was known as the buckboard scene. The buckboard scene is, is in the opening mm -hmm. uh, long sequence when he and Carol Baker are going back to her ranch. My father was not used to actors looking at the dailies and having anything to say about them, whereas Peck, of course, felt that he was a co-producer and he didn't like something about his performance and wanted it reshot, and my father wouldn't reshoot it. And that was the big blow up. And they managed to finish the picture without speaking to each other. And they didn't speak for a very long time. And some years later, uh, my father was receiving the AFI Life Achievement Award. And the story that I heard was, that um, Peck came up to him, you know, behind the scene, and they finally sh shook hands, and my father's first words were, but I'm still not gonna reshoot the buckboard scene. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's maybe one of the only scenes he didn't reshoot because his, the legend, of your dad is that he would shoot 50, 60 takes without communicating what it was he was looking for. Because he said that it, he didn't want to tell them and have it look phony, he wanted them to kind of find it themselves. And sometimes he just gave up. And, and sometimes I don't think he necessarily knew how to express the specific emotional vibe that he wanted, but he just wanted it to be authentic. And, 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 and he found that authenticity sometimes only came from frustration or anger or exhaustion, you know. Was he at home like that with you all too? Communic miscommunicating? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think he had that much patience with us. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> But you know, he expected a lot, that's for sure. Uh, but I don't, he didn't, well, I wouldn't say worked with us that way. No, I mean, he, his attitude towards actors and towards being on a set was that these people are paid, they're paid to be they're professional. He wanted a professional response. And if they were uh, amateurs, like, Audrey Hepburn, or like the kids in the Children's Hour, or uh, Harold Russell, he was very patient. But if they were professionals and they were not doing what he wanted or working with him to get what he wanted, he became brutal. Mm -hmm. well, I know Hank Fonda, after Jezebel, said, I don't want to work with him again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there were quite a few people who felt that way. Uh, Gene, Gene Simmons would never ever speak about uh, the big country again and her and what happened. And I, In fact, I think that y you, uh, did you give the DVD as a prize? Yes. That DVD was very, uh, it's very new from Kino and I think it has on it a documentary that I made uh, in 86 
for uh, called Directed by William Wyler. Which is a wonderful documentary, too. Thank you very much. It, really it was nominated is. for an Emmy. Okay. Uh, and I tried so hard. <laughs> I tried so hard to get Gene Simmons, and <laughs> absolutely not. Uh. She wouldn't speak about it ever. Well, and she's so good in the movie. Well, and she the, really but is. Apparently, Every, everybody's good in yeah, that movie too. Exactly. And that's what's so great about your dad's films. No matter how he got the performances, you know, John Ford wasn't a happy guy to a, a lot no. of the actors either. <laughs> All right. Uh, but he treated them differently. He was physically brutal too to them sometimes, rather than just non-communicative in the big country. It's got one of the most magnificent scores of all time, yeah. Jerome Moros. How did that happen? Because he only scored just a few films. Do you know anything? Were you at the recording sessions or anything? You know no, anything I, about I, that? I don't know. I wish I did. And what's amazing is my father was half deaf. He was completely deaf in one ear and hard of hearing in another ear. He loved music growing up. I don't know how, I mean, the score is fantastic. I mean, we all saw surfing movies in the 60s. <laughs> they put it all on the surfing. It's fantastic, I love it. Well, and, and it's like Aaron Copeland, almost. Yes. It's so unique. And uh, You gosh. used to hear it in elevators a lot. Elevator music seems to have disappeared, but I remember stepping into elevators and hearing that score. Well, the 60s was an odd time when they did take uh, classic movie scores from the 50s and put them like Magnificent Seven as a Marlboro, uh, right. iconic commercial mm -hmm. for right. that. As David said, he, my father was deafened in the war, and the war had a huge effect on him psychologically as well as physically. And one of the reasons that he made the big country was because it made fun of the sort of macho thing about the Old West. That scene in um, where the, the big fight between Gregory Peck and Charlton Heston, which some of it is shot from very far away. Spectacular. Right, and uh, Heston says in my documentary, I thought he was just being mean. What was he doing shooting the camera way up on the hill? I thought, he's just doing this to be mean. Um, but it, in the end, it was really about um, the futility of violence. And that, I think, is one of the reasons he wanted to make that film, to make that point. Well, the way it's shot, too, like you mentioned, I mean, those extremely long shots, and then it comes in tight, and there's no music until toward the end of the fight. And it's exhausting, They're and exhausting. it's real. It's so fabulous, too. And, and Chuck played a bad guy in that sort of I love mean, that. He's, yeah. he's just so good in it that did your dad say you're really a hero and I'm going to make you a bigger hero and Ben Hur? No, he hadn't cast Ben Hur at all. In fact, he was trying to get um, Kirk Douglas. Uh, no, not Kirk Douglas. He's trying to get um, Paul Newman hmm. to do Ben Hur. Young Paul Newman, but Paul Newman. He was didn't. too busy doing the silver chalice. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> or the robe. Maybe he felt he'd done too many of them. Yeah, uh, but his, maybe it wasn't Paul. But he wanted to get somebody who didn't want to do a, a sword and sandal movie, and so they ended up settling on, wow. you know, Heston, who he beat up the entire time to just you know drag a performance, out, the best performance out of him. My favorite, I'd say, I'm not sure it's my favorite. One of my most interesting moments in the, in the big country, which is a film uh, uh, against violence, um, is that strange moment where at the end, uh, Major Terrell is you know, riding out to fight with uh, uh, Burl Ives. Or his <coughs> double was maybe riding out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, you know, it was him, he, but I'm not sure he could get up on the horse. <laughs> Cut to him riding away. Um, and he's going out by himself. And there's that moment where, where uh, um, Heston has to decide, is he going to support the person who was his father figure, or is he going to do what he feels is morally right and stay away? Is he going to protect him? And so it's a wonderful moment of, of right. moral questioning yeah. where there's no right answer. And the way your dad put it together, you leave Heston there 
Bickford's already riding off. Yeah. And then we're on Bickford with a tracking shot. He's riding with us. And then all of a sudden, you're riding with them, and then you hear the music come in, and Heston rounds the corner, and a little smile comes on Bickford's yeah. face, and then all of a sudden, all the other riders right. come in, too, and the music right. builds. Ah, and, and, fabulous. And, and, and they're riding with him for the wrong reason, but we all understand why they're supporting mm -hmm. him, because it, it's that kind of a family feeling. So you know it's wrong, but you're still with them. It's mm -hmm. such an odd, interesting, the music made us fabulous with moment. <laughs> that is a great bit. Yeah, too. So, but morally it's, so, it's such a questionable mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. that's just fascinating yeah. to me. Burl Ives' family, too, was sort of questionable. Ugh. You know, like <laughs> beating up and kicking his son and he's crawling like a whining baby, Chuck Connors. Fabulous. What a performance that yeah. was, too. And Burl Ives, deserved the Oscar for that, too. He was a surprise for people, too. That same year, he gave another great performance as the leader of a group of uh, bird killers in the Everglades, really? wind across the Everglades for Nicholas Ray, and he is fantastic in that, too. The same year, I think. Nicholas Ray, great director. My name is Rob Word, and we love bringing these programs to you. We've got a lot more scheduled coming up. We post a new one every single week, and we want you to subscribe, like, and share. Thanks for watching.